This video is long overdue, and not only is there plenty to catch up on, but my research slash deep diving skills have greatly improved since. So I will be going a little deeper into some of what we've already covered in part 1, which, if you haven't watched yet, I suggest you do so first. Links will be in the description below. Aside from Stranger Things being delayed due to the world shutting down for nearly 3 years, everything seems to be going quite well for Winona. Her comeback was celebrated in a cheeky way by having it incorporated into a L'Oreal Paris commercial in 2018, which was directed by Romy Coppola, the son of famed director Francis Ford Coppola. We're ready for you. Beetlejuice celebrated its 30th anniversary. It's officially been 30 years since the ghost with the most, Beetlejuice, hit the big screen. Also, are you doing Work this? All night on a drink of rum. And both Girl Interrupted and Reality Bites celebrated their 25th anniversary. A very hard edge to it. In a way, it's like watching a boxing match. It delivers these these blows. But it was an incredibly invigorating experience. Um, it took such a long time to get it made that by the time we were shooting it, I was just so full of excitement and enthusiasm, and and I just couldn't believe that it was actually happening. She was a real champion for me, and that's uh, you don't see that often. And just, just I never forgot that she was somebody that loved the story so much. And the first time I read the script, when I was hooked from the inside of the front cover page, and then I was flipping the pages and flipping the pages, and it was just so incredible. It was one of the best scripts I've ever had the opportunity to read. You shut up! I busted my ass to find a job, any job. You don't even bother showing up for interviews. What is it that you want from me, huh? What is it? You want me to get a job on the line for the next 20 years until I'm granted leave with my gold-plated watch and my balls full of tumors because I surrendered the one thing that means shit to me? Well, honey, you can just exhale because it's not going to happen, not in this lifetime. In January of 2020, a fresh song tribute was released by the Irish pop rock band called Picture This with the song titled, you guessed it, Winona. She's got attitude, I wouldn't try her. And she looks just like a young Winona Ryder. In March of 2020, she took part in an HBO miniseries called The Plot Against America. And you're dragging everyone down with you! Not you, Evelyn. You're headed straight to the top. Which was an eight-episode set based on an alternate historical timeline from a novel by Philip Roth. You gotta get out of here. Canada. This is my country! Not anymore! It is Lindbergh's. Which, as we know, Winona tends to favor media based on literature. I think I wanted to be a writer because that's, but my parents are writers and they're incredible writers. And so I wanted to be like them and I loved to read. And so I think that was sort of what I was hoping. To do. Winona, you know the internet says that you want to be a competitive skateboarder. Oh, well, I did go through that stage. I definitely, I was on a skate team, believe it or not. I knew that I didn't have what it took to skate professionally, but. In October of 2020, Winona appeared as a guest star on the comedy show, Sarah Cooper, Everything is Fine. Hi. Oh my God, who are you? What are you doing down here? I'm Lacey Groin from Against the Groin. My show, it's on every, every night at nine. Oh my God, Lacey Groin. Yeah. I love your show. Aww. Created by Cooper, Maya Rudolph, and Natasha Leone. Natasha also serves as the director. She was featured in two Super Bowl ads in the meantime for Squarespace in 2020. I traveled a long way to answer this and to make a website. You don't say. I do say. Oh. I just want to find the real Winona, you know? Oh, it's everything between Pleasant Valley Road and the Mississippi. 
me. What about that one? Mm. I mean, in your heart of hearts, does that one feel right? No. And in 2021, for Cadillac, as Kim Boggs, her character from Edward Scissorhands, and with Timothy Chalamet. My son, Edgar. Hi, sweetie. Next up, Lancer Street. How magnets of opposite poles can actually... Yo, Edgar! You're gonna touch a lot of people. This was before Depp had redeemed himself in the Depp versus Heard trial. And yes, I will be doing a follow-up to the Johnny Depp video too, so stay tuned for that. I guess we may as well touch on Winona's part in the Depp versus Heard debacle now, as she had come up in the trial and had spoken out in his defense of his character. Actress Winona Ryder coming to her ex-fiance Johnny Depp's defense in his court battle against the British tabloid. Ryder saying she was, quote, shocked, confused, and upset by allegations he was abusive towards his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Maggie really has more. This morning, Winona Ryder's calling her old friend and one-time fiance, Johnny Depp, a really good man. Ryder coming to her ex's defense as Depp is suing the publisher of The Sun over an article that called him a wife beater, something The Sun says is accurate and Depp denies. In a statement obtained by the BBC, Ryder says she cannot wrap her head around the allegations, adding, I do not want to call anyone a liar, but from my experience of Johnny, it is impossible to believe that such horrific allegations are true. I find it extremely upsetting knowing him as I do. The two stars have been a part of each other's lives for nearly 30 years. In the early 90s, a 26-year-old Depp proposed to Ryder after just three months, heating up red carpets, starring beside each other in Edward Scissorhands. Were you scared? And then there was that tattoo, Winona Forever, their love immortalized on Depp's arm. Now the Stranger Things star is defending her former flame in his sensational trial as the actor faces 14 domestic violence allegations against him from his ex-wife Amber Heard. Winona Ryder is a very powerful advocate for Johnny Depp throughout, throughout this process and I think that her statements and the information that she's provided to the court is going to be very impactful moving forward. Depp's marriage to the 34-year-old actress lasted just 13 months, but Heard claims that time was filled with drugs and violence, accusing Depp of once throwing a bottle of champagne at her. But Depp not only denies all allegations, he's also firing back, accusing Heard of punching him in the face and claiming she once threw a glass bottle at him, severing his finger. And Johnny Depp's other ex-wife and the mother of his children, Vanessa Parody, is also coming to his defense. She calls him a very good man. But guys, this trial here is far from over. We're expecting it to go on for at least a few more weeks, and Heard herself is supposed to testify. Johnny had a tattoo that used to be a dedication to Winona that Amber had a huge problem with, and it caused many fights. Eventually, he conceded and had a tattoo for Amber done. But as we learned from the trial, there was nothing that would have appeased her bottomless void of self-worth and security. Mr. Depp, do you recall at the beginning of her opening, uh, Ms. Heard's counsel mentioned that the first time you supposedly struck Ms. Heard was in response to a comment about one of your tattoos? Yes, I remember. And what is your response to that? It didn't, it, it didn't happen. I, I've never struck Ms. Heard. As I said yesterday, I've never struck Ms. Heard. Um, I've never struck a woman in my life. Um, I'm certainly not going to strike a woman if she decides to make fun of a tattoo that I have on my body. It's like going in into someone's journal and picking out a uh, things you don't like she had made mention uh, I, I, there was no incident of 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 argument when she when the tattoo thing has been had been brought up many many times and I mean, there's really nothing i can do my i've always thought of my body as a as a journal 
if you will, to, to, to mark experiences, to mark life experiences. It's, you know, for example, when you're, when my first child was born, I, I had her name tattooed um, on my, over my heart, which is where her little head used to be when I rock her to sleep. Um, I, I marked my boy's birth by uh, tattooing myself for him. So um, no one can go back or no one should go back and rewrite their journals. Why would I take such great offense to someone making fun of a, a, a tattoo uh, on my body? It, uh, it, it, that, 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 that allegation never made any sense to me whatsoever. Are there any tattoos that you had that Miss Heard had an issue with, to your understanding? Um, well, the, the um, what a, a tattoo that I believe is up here, uh, which used to say, uh, Winona Forever was a former girlfriend. And, um, We'd been together for a few years, um, Winona Ryder, and uh, when we when when we broke up, um, how do you fix that? I did go back and re rewrite my journal to some degree. I I took off the last two letters um, and had it say Wino forever. Um, just because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was, f again, through pain comes humor. Humor has to come in there so at some point into the pain. And that's how you play it out in your mind. So. I, I have, uh, I think sometimes abstractly uh, in, in that sense, so I changed it to Wino forever. Seemed that nothing Johnny did was right or enough, and she had claimed that his reactions to her mental and physical abuse showed that he, in fact, was the abuser. This is called reactive abuse, and a man defending himself against a vindictive and manipulative woman that chooses violence does not make the man abusive. Pushing someone to their limit in order to gain a desired reaction is the abuse. Amber would purposely rev him up just for the sole purpose of collecting video evidence to build a specific character to show her friends and maintain her narrative. Did something happen to you this morning? I don't think so. Um, no, that's the thing. You want to see grades? I'll give you a fucking grade. Nice grade. Oh, you're crazy. Are you crazy? Yeah, have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this going. You got this going. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yes. really? Other former lover, Kate Moss, took the stand and shattered Amber's entire storyline with the truth. Miss Moss, do you know Johnny Depp? Yes, I do. How do you know Mr. Depp? I had a relationship with him. Uh, did there come a time when you and Mr. Depp had a romantic relationship? Yes. For how long, Ms. Moss, were you and Mr. Depp a romantic couple? From 1993 
1998. Ms. Moss, did there come a time when you, uh, while you and Mr. Depp were a couple, that the two of you took a vacation together to the Golden Eye Resort in Jamaica? Yes. What, if anything, happened when you were in Jamaica with Mr. Depp? I, um, we were leaving the room and Johnny left the room before I did and there had been a rainstorm. And as I left the room, I slid down the stairs and I hurt my back. How did you... And... I apologize, Miss Moss, please continue. And I screamed because I was in, uh, because I didn't know what had happened to me and I was in pain. And um, he came running back to help me and carried me to my room and got me medical attention. Did Mr. Depp push you in any way down the stairs? No. Uh, during the course of your relationship, did he ever push you down any stairs? No. He never pushed me, kicked me, or threw me down any stairs. Ms. Moss, have you ever before today testified in any kind of court proceeding? No, I have never. Why did you decide to testify today? Objection, Your Honor. All right, let's be on the scope of what we just talked about. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Uh, we have nothing further at this time. We greatly appreciate your taking the time to testify. All right. Any cross-examination? No, Your Honor. All right. You're free to go. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The truth of the matter, of course, is that Amber never loved Johnny. She seduced him with her siren song, and once she had her in, she became this all-consuming negative entity that nearly ruined Johnny and his career. Her attempts to leverage her life and career based on lies about the relationship is what brought about the trial and gave Depp the ability to not only redeem himself, but regain his own sense of self-worth and confidence, of which Amber had bled him dry and took as her own. This had also allowed him to shift his focus to, and create buzz for, his music and tour after the fact. So he's now able to do what he'd always wanted to do, and share his love for music with the world, as well as recapture his rightful position in Hollywood. Don't believe, don't believe. Anyways, back to Winona. Season 4 of Stranger Things finally returned in May of 2022 with 7 episodes, with an additional 2 episodes in July of 2022. It was also renewed for its fifth and final season. Filming is intended to begin between May and June of 2023. In February of 2022, Beetlejuice 2 was confirmed, with more details to be announced. In July of 2022, Winona had a starring role in the American thriller called Gone in the Night. This is like the inside of your brain. Everything all old school. Dude, the game for lovers. I'm gonna turn in. Max? Max! Alongside her former co-star, Dermot Mulroney. So you want to call her? No, I need to find her. Can't do a stakeout without a partner. In March of 2023, Michael Keaton confirmed to have reprised his role of Beetlejuice in Beetlejuice 2. Jenna Ortega from the Netflix series Wednesday is also joining. Should also begin filming in either May or June of 2023. And it's believed that Winona will be returning as older Lydia and that Ortega will be playing her daughter. It's rumored that Johnny Depp will also be joining the cast. And what role he would play is unclear. 
perhaps as Lydia's husband. Either way, fans of Tim Burton, Winona, and Jeff are thrilled to hear about a possible reunion. Not only due to the history between Johnny and Winona, but for the history they both share with Tim. Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, Frank and Meanie, help me out guys. Um, I, I did a video with him for the band The Killers. It's an absolute dream. He's just one of my favorite people. And I also credit him with giving me a career. He's just the best. I, I loved him. Johnny has a long and extensive list of work alongside Burton, which led to the who gets custody of Johnny joke during the divorce between he and Helen Bonham Carter, with whom Johnny had worked alongside many times as well. And, and obviously when there's big money involved, which there is, for, for people to trust people like you to make something as strange as the films you tend to choose, uh, that's a big risk by then. And yet you guys don't seem that fussed about it. You seem like, I'm going to do this. You have that confidence in your own vision or your own ideas. Was that always the case, Tim? Yeah, I mean, it's confidence or stupidity or just ignorance <laughs> or whatever, but it's just kind of the desire to make what we wanted. And, and I've been lucky from the very beginning, to, you know, from you know, scissor hands, even though they didn't really want to do it, but, you know, after Batman, I got the chance to kind of just do a low-budget kind of thing. So I've been had the chance to, you know, do the things I've wanted to do. Do you guys uh, hang out together or see each other much when you're not working together? I mean, we've talked about that. You're, you're, uh, you're here uh, in the UK now. You're living with Helena, as you said, Helena Bonham Carter, and you have uh, two children, beautiful two children. Uh, do you guys sort of go see each other much? Do you hang out? Do you socialise? Do, do you bond? Do you go drinking, bowling? Do you go fishing? Do you do anything else? <laughs> shopping? I forgot oh. ice dancing. Yeah, yeah. ice dancing. Synchronized oh. swimming. Synchronized yeah. swimming. <laughs> My relationship with Tim is... It's family. I somehow know how he works, how he ticks, and and certainly, you know, he knows me pretty much better than anyone. We did our first movie together like 17 years ago, man. <laughs> you know, she almost don't want to even question like what what is it? I, you know, I just I just know that it is, and that's kind of what's important. God, you guys are like family now. I mean, it's... Well, we're kind of like a strange family. Um, yeah. Um, um, but we don't really see each other. <laughs> <laughs> like normal family. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, no, I mean, when we work, we see each other all the time. Yeah. Well, when, I mean, if we have to be in the same place or something like that. Do you, do you holiday together at all? I don't even holiday with my own family, so <laughs> we'd really be in trouble if I holiday well, you know, with him. Well, you know, but that's, that's, it's just a phone call Jeez. away, Tim. Just phone them up and say, hey, we're thinking about a set in the park or somewhere. What are you doing? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm kids. I'm off. Did you ever expect this to happen? You seem to have the perfect life. You're with oh. a great, uh, you know, yeah. a great companion, father yeah. to your children. You both have this strange but ideal living arrangement where perfect. you're we connecting have a marriage, houses. We don't have to live together. It's <laughs> yes. perfect. And you've yeah. got these gorgeous kids. No, touch wood. I feel profoundly lucky, like over lucky. But I don't, you know. Did you think that would happen, or did you think this is this is going to be my life no, in, the, in the theater? No, yeah. at 35 I was doomed to singledom and, you know, I never was going to meet Prince Charming. I mean, not that Tim's exactly the prince that... Well, he is the Prince Charming, so... But, um, no, I didn't, of course not. No, I had the crisis and it, it just surprised me every day. I feel profoundly lucky. Lucky I am very aware of it. And I am very, very lucky and I just keep on thinking something's going to happen. We hear about Tim and Johnny Depp as this great team. Do you feel like you're part of that team? Are you, uh, no. do you let Tim go off and do, and let him surprise you whatever he wants to do? Tim or did, to are do you a sounding board? Uh, I'm, I'm a sounding board for when he needs it. But, um, I'm, he knows I'm there next door. <laughs> <laughs> but Tim will always do what he wants and he also knows that I'll always do what I want. So, um, it's nice to live separately. I mean, we don't live separately. We live just in this house that has no, that has two halves that look wildly different, you know. But at least we had this a choice in seeing each other, you know. Yes. It sounds very English in a way. Very lucky. Yeah. Like very like, very. like the king and queen with their separate suites or something. Yeah. I mean people did until not long ago. You know, they had um, separate rooms. It was very rare to just live in the same space. Yeah. Do you see pretty much eye to eye? 
because it's unusual that uh, a couple who's worked together on so many films are still friendly, are still prepared to work together. I mean, most, you know, most directors I know eventually they hit a wall with their, with their leading actors and vice versa. You're on the same page pretty much all the time? Yeah, I mean, oddly, you know, like, even when it comes down to, you know, the script notes and stuff like that, we sit down and talk about the character and talk about a scene and uh, compare script notes, and there, there have been times when, when they've been uh, identical, you know, or, or, or the notes on the page. Um, and then the approach to the character, like with the Mad Hatter, for example, I had this weird little uh, watercolor that I'd done of what I thought it should look like, and I thought of Tim, and you know, Tim had his drawings, and it was like, they, they were very, very close. So, and how, and how is Tim as a director? How communicative is he as a director? I'm led to believe that you're not the most verbal director when it comes to giving notes and advice and guidance on the set. Yeah, he isn't, but I mean, at the same time, he knows exactly what he wants, and there's, a, there's an incredible shorthand that somehow developed or actually happened right away on the decision where it could literally be, you know, turn his head that way and it, and do something with his hands and he go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what he meant? I know what I meant. So almost like the way uh, very close family members communicate or twins, you kind of know what each other's. It must be kind of frustrating for people who are left out. Do they pretend they know what you want and then get it tragically wrong sometimes? Right, I was looked up recently when people were just, they, we just heard you guys talking, we didn't know what you guys were talking about <laughs> for half an hour. You know? yeah. It was like, that's the good thing. He said that, he said, I just listened to you until you speak, have this conversation, he says, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, That's why it takes two of us to go on a talk show because maybe one <laughs> sentence will come out. Together, we'll get some sentence. Winona credits Tim for helping launch her career, and of course, he was in part responsible for bringing Winona and Johnny together originally. When I got the big two script, I was like, oh, please, can we go and can I, you know, meet? And, and I remember I went into this on the lot, and I was sitting in this like waiting room, and, and this guy came up, and we're talking, and you know, we're talking about like music and movies and just just talking for like 25 minutes and, and then I was like D am I in the right building because do you want to see burn guys coming he's like oh that's me <laughs> and I was like what I because I had no idea at that age that a director could be like someone that I could sort of out with and like talk about the, you know, they were, I was very young, but they, they were, you know, more author, authority figures and, and wonderful, the two that I had worked with, but I just had no idea that someone that I would hang out with anyway, if he was like a messenger or from just the art department or wherever, you know, we were like wearing the same, you know, my hair was that color and, 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 so it's his and we're both wearing black. I just don't know where, what kind of role ups I would have gotten if I hadn't have done that movie. Even doing that movie, I, you know, I, I still had to, you know, but it did lead to other things. So I, I do feel like a very strong bond with him. And, and, he, and then, then of course, Edward Scissorhands, which is like one of my favorite films to watch even regardless that I mean it's just so beautiful and then this movie it, I just feel so, so much gratitude but just also just tremendous love for him he, he is someone that um, he's changed my life you know and in real in a personal way in, in, in a professional way and um, I, I do feel you know I he has such a strong vision, and I, I know Beatrice really was you know, his vision. And I like just feel so lucky that I got to be part of it. And I like to think I brought a little something because I was sort of like that. But you know, it, it's it's so much it's so much his vision, but he, he invites us in in such a warm, um, interesting way. He's not like anybody. Ever. I can't do you can you guys even remember what, what it would be like without without Tim? Like he, he kind of was the original. I mean there's been a lot of people that have been inspired by him, but he was what before him it, what was there like anyone like him for I mean Well he's I mean, unique. He, he's just this his style well, and his Yeah, he's unique in Hollywood because he's an English director who's allowed 
when I use the word aloud to make the movies that interesting, period. To be released near the end of July of 2023, Winona was cast for an undisclosed role in the much-anticipated Walt Disney adaptation of the supernatural horror comedy, The Haunted Mansion. This house has a way of playing tricks on you. <laughs> With an all-star cast, including Jamie Lee Curtis, Rosario Dawson, Danny DeVito, Owen Wilson, Tiffany Haddish, and Lakeith Stanfield. Other more powerful entities may come through. Not on our watch. Well, what are you going to do? Seriously. Yeah. They're already dead. Yeah. They're going to be deader. I'm unsure if I'm happy or concerned to report that this guy, Mike Meyer, who was mentioned in part one, is still very much obsessed with Winona if not more so, adding dozens of more songs in tribute to her on his YouTube channel. Now let's get back to Stranger Things, which was originally meant to be called Montauk, based on what is still an unconfirmed project that was believed to have been undertaken at a military base located in Montauk, New York. On Montauk Point, New York sits a state park that used to house an active U.S. military base and Air Force station. Nowadays, you can wander around the park, taking in the scenery, checking out the abandoned radar tower, and possibly contracting Lyme disease from the ticks in the area. Many people are drawn to the site because of the mysterious story that started coming out of there in the 1980s about secret government experiments that were being conducted on people, including young children. Under the ground of Camp Hero, which is what the base was actually called, a bit on the nose if you ask me, were a network of tunnels and rooms where scientists and military higher-ups were experimenting with mind control, psychic espionage, and interdimensional travel. Initially pitched with the name Montauk, the mysterious story was the original jumping-off point for the Duffer Brothers' Netflix juggernaut, but production issues had them changing the location to Indiana and calling it Stranger Things instead. Really? Well, there you go. The more you know. Anyway, back in Montauk, all sorts of stuff was going on. Radars were set up in the late 1940s and early 1950s as early warning systems, and in 1960, a massive AN FPS 35 radar was built that's still a well known landmark today. Hugely powerful and apparently set up with countermeasures to resist any electronic interference, it messed with local residents' TV reception and reportedly gave people headaches. Could it also have been used as some sort of psychic or mind entering device? The general story of the so called Montauk Project has a little something like this. Deep underground, in a secret set of labs, subjects, in large part runaway or vulnerable children or young people, were broken down with so much psychological, physical, and pharmaceutical abuse that they became totally compliant, and the lab staff could effectively program them to do whatever they wanted. This sounds a bit Manchurian candidate, doesn't it? With the help of devices such as a chair that helped focus telepathic energy, these subjects were able to see through the eyes of other people elsewhere on the planet, manifest physical objects from their minds, and even open up portals in space and time. Hundreds of subjects were used, many being lured or kidnapped from the streets, and those who weren't lost in space and time or killed and disposed of were subjected to intense memory manipulation so they wouldn't be able to remember what was done to them. Honestly, probably for the best. There was one person in particular who possessed extra strong psychic abilities, and one day, after some other people working on the project agreed it had gone too far, he was given the signal to let rip. In the Montauk chair, as it was called, he conjured a beast from his mind which manifested somewhere in the labs, laying waste to anything it could find, until the only thing left to do was get rid of it and totally destroy all of the equipment and radar needed to carry out the experiments. Finally, after everything was smashed up, the beast vanished and the project was ended. In 1984, after crack military teams had removed anything worth salvaging from the site, the underground area was filled in with cement. Inspiration was heavily drawn from the confirmed human experiments that took place between the 40s and the 70s, with emphasis on the theories regarding the sub-projects that focused on the supernatural and alternate dimensions. In the 1950s, the CIA started a project called MKUltra, which lasted for 10 years and was totally classified and top secret. This was a good reason because it turned out they were illegally experimenting on people and giving them mind-altering drugs with the aim of controlling their minds. This is so this is completely true. There were like there, there was like fake brothels that they set up and sh it was intense. Like CIA is like uh, 
they're up to some shady the project wasn't confined to a single location either it was carried out across north america with u.s and canadian citizens becoming test subjects to see how far drugs and psychological techniques could go in controlling someone's mind materials which will render the induction of hypnosis easier or otherwise enhance its usefulness substances which will enhance the ability of individuals to withstand privation torture and coercion during interrogation or so-called brainwashing many were people from marginalized areas of society such as the homeless sex workers and the terminally ill they didn't have the knowledge means or strength to fight against what was happening to them and the hearing concluded that the mk ultra project demonstrated quote a fundamental disregard for the value of human life <laughs> was to show that the u.s government has been proven to use unwitting people as guinea pigs for experiments involving mind-altering drugs in very secretive conditions it happens with mk ultra so why couldn't it have gone a step further a couple of decades later with project montauk the 80s easter eggs brought major attention and that good good nostalgia with references to steven spielberg david lynch john carpenter stephen king wes craven and some of the forefathers of horror like hp lovecraft to really get into the feel for the era the children who auditioned were made to read lines from Rob Reiner's Stand By Me. Could he have gotten all the way from Chamberlain to Harlem? That's really far. Sure. He must have started walking on the train tracks and just followed them the whole way. Yeah. Yeah, right. And then after dark, train must have come along and I'll smack go. Yeah. The Duffer Brothers selected 1983 as the beginning due to it being one year before the events in the Charlie Sheen film Red Dawn, the plot taking place during a fictional World War III, where the teens in a small town rise up in defense. Ask his father that the last creature alive. Be allowed to go free. Well now, my friend. Well now. Oh, check it out. All right. They look pretty cool, though, man. I would say they were way off course. Uh -huh. This is very unusual. You do something, Mr. Teasdale. We're going to the mountains. We're getting out of here. Who are they, near as you can tell? I heard some of them speaking Spanish, Mr. Morris. Did you see any of them? Oh, we speak with you. Come on, man. Oh, my Just relax. Robert. Oh, my God. Robert, no. Boys, come on. Get in there and get sleeping bags and food. Right now. Come on. Hurry up, boys. Let's go, son. When we left off in Winona Part 1, it was right before the release of Stranger Things Season 3, which was on July 4th of 2019, to coincide with the day and events in the first episode of the season adding an immersive experience alongside the nostalgia. It shattered Netflix viewership records, with over 40 million households having watched in the first four days of launch, and 18.2 million had completed the series within that four days. Within the first month, it was watched by 64 million households. The franchise and fandom are enormous, likely due to the extreme nostalgia factor which is a now growing trend across eras of generations. To answer this phenomenon, many specialized sponsorships took place, such as the one with Coca-Cola that released a limited line called New Coke. How do you even drink that? Because it's delicious. What? what? It's like Carpenter's the thing. The original is the classic, no question about it. But the remake? Which was originally from 1985 and coincides with the show's timeline. Attention Pepsi drinkers, introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola, the best Coca-Cola ever. That's all I'm going to say. In fact, that's all I have to say. No more words. Get your first taste now at McDonald's. Look who's got the new taste of Coke. Fantastic.
fantastic. It's a great new taste. I can't believe they could improve Coke. It's the best Coke I've ever had. It's just delicious. Well, we went digging into the archive room for that. April 23rd, 1985, the day that new Coke was unveiled in the universe. And today, Coke announced it is bringing new Coke back, same recipe as part of a short-term marketing strategy with a Netflix show, Stranger Things. This was a bold and cheeky move on the part of Coca-Cola. Considering the new formula they launched in 1985 completely tanked and was reversed in less than three months due to extreme protest. What on earth brought us to the decision to bring back the classic taste which we so calmly abandoned back in April? Well, there is a twist to this story, which it seems to me will please every humanist and will probably have uh, Harvard uh, professors puzzling uh, for years. The simple fact is that all of the time and money and skill poured into consumer research on the new Coca-Cola could not measure or reveal the depth and abiding emotional attachment to original Coca-Cola felt by so many people. They said that they wanted the original taste of Coca-Cola back and they wanted it soon. Now we knew that we'd hear concerns from certain quarters, places where Coke is a, is a vital part of the culture. And indeed, perhaps the greatest anguish did come out of the South where we live. But the passion for original Coke, and that's the word for it, really, it's passion. That passion was something that just flat caught us by surprise. But America's emotional ties to Coca-Cola would be strained as never before during 80 fateful days in 1985. What was happening in the mid-80s was the market for sugar cola was a declining market. And so folks for the first time began to question whether or not people had actually become tired of the taste of Coca-Cola. When you change the formula, you attack something that has an awful lot of built-up mystique with the American people. But in the mid-80s, those people seemed to want something new. The fateful decision was made late in 1984. Press ahead with a top-secret program to launch a new Coke. It wasn't something that was talked about. It had code names secret meetings, late night phone calls, all building up to the introduction of what we believe was the best soft drink on earth. The big day, April 23rd, 1985. A day all Coke drinkers would long remember. The Coca-Cola Company CEO, Roberto Gazueta, broke the news at a New York City press conference. The best soft drink, Coca-Cola, is now going to be even better. Simply stated, we have a new formula for Coke. Then came the questions from the press. I mean, are you 100% certain that this won't bomb this new formula? New Coke was launched in a confident blaze of publicity. But public reaction was immediate and negative. All of the taste tests said People preferred the taste of this new product to the century-old product. What they hadn't factored in was the huge emotional attachment there was to this brand. But it wasn't the taste of new Coke that people didn't like. It was the idea of it, of changing a constant like Coca-Cola. By mid-May, the Coca-Cola Company's Atlanta headquarters had hired extra operators to handle the 5,000 angry calls coming in each day. By June, they were handling 8,000 a day. Just like the soldiers in World War II wrote these love letters about the brand, the American people were astounded that we would change the formula for a product that had been part of their lives for almost a century at the time it was introduced. And they told us in no uncertain terms that we shouldn't do that. We didn't have the right to change the formula of their product. And many of them weren't Coca-Cola drinkers. 
They're just American citizens who believe that something fundamental that's a part of their society has come under attack. So you can never get away from it, the psychology of Coke. And that's where they made their, their fundamental mistake, as far as I'm concerned. By July, the company had decided that enough was enough and held another press conference. The news about the introduction of Coca-Cola Classic ran on the Dow Jones wire at 3.18 p.m. yesterday. I'm Don Keogh, president of the Coca-Cola Company. When we brought you the new taste of Coke, we knew that millions would prefer it, and millions do. And we knew that it would beat the taste of our major competitor, and it does. What we didn't know was how many thousands of you would phone and write asking us to bring back the classic taste of original Coca-Cola. Well, we read and we listened, and you know the rest. Now, the reason I'm backtracking on this so much is because time is not linear, and at the time, I didn't dig this deep or know what I know now. If you've watched the majority of my Dark Hollywood videos, you will have noticed that all of these directors, films, themes, etc. have come up in various ways across the series, especially in the Drew Barrymore and Charlie Sheen episodes. And that's all I'm going to say about that. When you read between the lines, what do you think Stranger Things is trying to tell us? Moving on. If you disregard the state's satanic ritual theory, the entire nature of the crime changes. It starts you thinking, well, we're, maybe we're not looking for these extreme suspects. We're looking for someone who's kind of ordinary, invisible. To catch up with you and how you're doing, it's been three years since you were released from prison. Yes. And, and what has your life been like for the last three years? It's, uh, it's odd, you know, whenever you get out of prison, people think you're just going to be excited and happy that you're out. And you are, but at the same time, there's a lot of shock and trauma and, and everything else that goes along with that. I had been in solitary confinement for almost 10 years before I was released. You know, the last time I'd seen a computer was, I believe, 1986 or 1988. And back then, it was basically a glorified typewriter for rich people. It wasn't right. connected to the internet or anything. Um, I'd never used a cell phone or an ATM card or any of that. So, so it was a major adjustment. Huge, and I'm still adjusting. Many people say that you and Jesse and Jason became targets uh, of, the, by, of the police or by the police you were targeted. Why do you think that was the case? Why do you think they rushed to judgment, if you will? We came from a very hardcore, fundamentalist, right-wing, Bible Belt town where anyone who didn't fit in with, you know, the local ideology or political climate or anything else was... Or even appearance, exactly. right? Exactly. The way I dress, the music I listen to, the books I read. You know, as, as evidence at the trial, they actually introduced things like Stephen King novels. They said that was proof that I was satanic. And, and when you heard the verdict in that courtroom of guilty, I understand it was really an out-of-body experience for you in many ways. The only thing I can describe it as is if, you, if you've ever been beaten, you know, if you've ever been punched in the head, a lot of times it doesn't always immediately register as pain. It's more like a bright flash of light and a loud noise and you're so disoriented you can barely keep your feet up under you. And that's what it's like hearing yourself sentenced to death. It's like being beaten repeatedly in the head. I was sentenced to die not once and not twice, but three times. They sentenced me to die over and over and over again. The documentary Paradise Lost, the HBO doc, came out in, in 1996. And it seemed as if that really started the movement of people questioning why you were convicted of this crime, why you were serving time. Do you think that's when this all started? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I always tell people that this case is nothing out of the ordinary. Stuff like this happens to people all the time in the judicial system. The only thing that made our case exceptional was they had cameras in the courtroom. They called the trial on film. If not for that, they would have killed me and this would have been swept under the rug and completely forgotten about. But due to the fact that they got it on film, it spurred people on to do everything from have bake sales and benefit concerts to putting together websites and Every time there was a court hearing, people would show up at the Capitol to uh, hold signs and protest. That was what really got the ball rolling that saved my life. And, and all these uh, celebrities, as I mentioned, people like Eddie Vedder, Johnny Depp, the director, Peter Jackson, they all gravitated towards your case and they became crusaders for you. Why, what was it about your case that, that made them want to, 
to really step in and take serious action, like Peter Jackson hiring investigators, doing all kinds of things on your behalf. I think it was a, a couple of different things. One with people like uh, Eddie Vedder and Johnny Depp, you know, not only did they come to our aid in the case, but they, over the years, they became as close as biological family to us. And, and they've always said what it was with them was the fact that whenever they first saw me, they first saw the film footage, they realized if it would have been them in that same place at that same time, that they would have been the targets. They would have been the outcasts. For Peter, it's more the fact that Peter hates bullies. He can't stand bullies. And he saw someone with no ability to defend themselves being picked on by the state, and he wanted to even the playing field. I know that in your case, uh, something called the Alfred plea was used as a way to, to really get you out of prison. Yes. Can you explain what that is and uh, why it was used? It's really rare, bizarre, and nonsensical. What an Alfred plea means is you're accepting a guilty plea and maintaining your innocence at the same time. The reason it exists is so that it sort of brings closure to a case and it prevents the state from being held responsible for what they've done. They don't have to compensate you in any sort of way or ever admit that they made a mistake. Um, you know, people ask me, did I have a hard time accepting that, coming to terms with it? taking that plea and the answer is no because you know I've been in prison for almost 20 years I was losing my eyesight my health was deteriorating degenerating rapidly you know on death row there's almost no such thing as medical care and dental care they're not going to spend a lot of time and money and energy taking care of someone they plan on killing I was literally dying I knew that if it if I did not take this deal I was never going to live to see the outside of those walls so it was something you felt compelled to do on the other hand does it infuriate you that the people responsible for this miscarriage of justice will never be held accountable. It does. Um, not one single person has been or will ever be held responsible. You know, people have built careers for themselves off of this case, and none of them will ever be brought to justice because of it. Do you think that the authorities will ever find out who really killed those three boys? I think what will have to happen the people that are in office, the people that hold those positions right now, those people will either have to retire or move on, and new people that don't have a vested interest in keeping it covered up will have to come into these positions. Then, one day, eventually, we'll see justice. The men accused of murder in that West Memphis 3 case may get a second chance to argue their innocence. Evidence that was said to have been destroyed has actually been found intact, and now they're trying to have it tested for DNA analysis. THV 11's Ashley Godwin explains. Turns out there's evidence the whole time that could have overturned this conviction you know, 20 years ago. This is monumental. Oh, yeah. the, the evidence was there. After 18 months of fighting to see evidence that was once believed to be destroyed, Damien Eccles' legal team got their chance. This week, lawyers were able to comb through it, looking for clues as to what really happened in the case of the West Memphis Three. Some of it included shoelaces that were used to tie up the children. We certainly want to bring some measure of closure to the families of these three children. And of course, hopefully, uh, in, the, in that same moment, exonerate uh, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Kelly. Now the lawyers are looking to test the evidence for DNA using new technology that wasn't available 10 years ago. To use what's called the MVAC testing, which is a vacuum procedure that removes whatever DNA is there. Also this week, West Memphis Police Chief Mike Pope will resign. In a letter dated December 7th, but only released to the public this week, he tells the mayor he has other endeavors and goals that are pointing him to a different direction. According to a city spokesperson, Pope's resignation has no relation to the West Memphis Three developments. His last day is tomorrow. In Little Rock, Ashley Godwin, THV 11 News. Even with the new evidence, and well after their release, many people still believed that the original West Memphis Three convicts were guilty of those most vicious and brutal crimes. I'm on the fence personally, and generally I try to approach every angle from a neutral standpoint, but I do want to mention something that's been scarcely considered as of yet. Based on a theory called the McDonald Triad, there seems to be a pattern among serial killers of starting small with weaker victims who are less able to defend themselves. 
like with animals, or in more extreme cases, children. With the intensity and frequency of their compulsions and crimes increasing until reaching serial status, what if these children were the equivalent of that for a similar serial killer who went on to commit these same atrocities, but with young men, including the use of rope and bondage, as well as more specific aspects like the bodily and reproductive mutilation. The three boys, Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, were found in a seriously bad way, in an area called Robin Hood Hills, which was an undeveloped ravine. On May 6, 1993, immediately the crime was considered some kind of satanic ritual, and the three black sheep of the small religious town were immediately targeted. Your run-of-the-mill metalheads, with a fascination with the occult and darkness, as most metalheads do. I can personally contest that out of any concert crowd, metalheads are actually the kindest and most polite, but that's here in Canada though, so I can't really vouch for these lads specifically. However, I did do some backwards searching, and there was a body found on February 1st, 1994. The body mutilated in a very similar fashion, there were rope burns in the skin, and his manhood was removed. This man had not been identified until 2021 as Gerald Lombard of Lowell, Massachusetts. Charlotte County detectives have solved a 27-year-old mystery. Jerry Lombard has been known as John Doe No. 1 for almost three decades. Now that deputies have identified him, the victim's family finally knows what happened to him. But that doesn't make it any easier to accept. NBC2 Samantha Serban spoke with Lombard's family today. She shows us how their question has changed from where is my brother to why was he murdered? For nearly three decades, the Lombard family searched for their missing loved one. They say when he disappeared, at first they weren't worried because it was his normal nature. But when he stopped calling, that's when they got concerned. Gerald Anthony Lombard born in Massachusetts in 1962, murdered in Port Charlotte in 1994. It's heartbreaking. I still can't believe it. I was kind of like, uh, wow, this is not the way I, I wanted to hear how his life ended. You know, it's tragic. Jerry Lombard's 15 living siblings are just now grieving his death. For 27 years, investigators knew his remains as John Doe number one, found dead in these woods presumably killed at the hands of serial killer Daniel Conahan. And I've always been curious why and I mean, how he came about meeting with this, this evil. Investigators say had Lombard been reported missing, he could have been ID'd sooner. But the Lombard family says it wasn't out of character for Jerry to disappear. Although Jerry was a drifter, he always kept in contact with his brothers and sisters and, and my mom. I know my mother was sad and she cried a lot talking about Jerry. It kept saying, I know he's dead. I know he's dead. Some siblings took it upon themselves to find Jerry, but with no property or ID, it took investigators, dedication, and new technology to finally get answers. Now? I personally want to bring him home and stuff and give him a proper burial. This is really heartbreaking. I, lo I love you, Jerry. Um, I, I wish I could have been a more help to you so that your, your path didn't end up in this direction. Now the question is what to do with Jerry's remains. The family can either donate his remains to forensic science education or bring him home to be buried. In Charlotte County, Samantha Serban, NBC2. Which just goes to show the importance of using the modernized technology available to law enforcement, especially in crimes such as these, where those doing the time may not have done the crime and may be owed a full exoneration. Daniel Conahan Jr. He was known around here. Just mention his name in Charlotte County. He was a bad, a bad person. The Hog Trail Killer has been linked to more than a dozen murders. Body parts were found in the woods within a 10 mile radius of his home in the 1990s. Some still haven't been identified. Many found with rope marks on their bodies and evidence they were raped and tortured before they were killed. Daniel Conahan grew up in Punta Gorda, a well to do suburb in Florida and had a fairly average childhood. As he entered puberty, he realized he was interested in other boys rather than girls. His parents were extremely disappointed in this and sent him to a series of psychiatrists and conversion programs in hopes they could alter his orientation. When he graduated in 1973, he was drinking heavily and using drugs as an outlet to escape his reality, believing it would help him get in touch with his heteronormative roots and straighten him out as a sober and productive member of society he was encouraged to join the U.S. Navy. 
He was stationed in Illinois, but within a year he was discharged. He had become involved with fellow naval officers, one in which ended in a fight because it was claimed to have been forced. But all in all, we know during this time, behavior such as this was strongly discouraged, especially in this setting. After his discharge in 1976, he started frequenting the gay bars in Chicago. He supported himself by doing odd jobs and street work. He became known for his violence towards his clients and had been arrested several times. This shows there was a clear pattern of traveling back and forth between Chicago and Florida during this time, before promptly moving back home to his parents mid-1993. Memphis is a major travel hub as an alternative pit stop rather than passing through the more major cities like Nashville and Atlanta on this route. Psych experts did later confirm that the brutality of his attacks on these men showed a marked hatred for himself. Since the majority of his spare time continued to be spent in gay bars, was the self-loathing he harbored growing to such a level that he finally followed through on an impulse while passing through West Memphis and stumbled across the three small unaccompanied boys? Over the next few years, Conahan committed several similar and equally brutal murders until he was identified by witnesses in May of 1996. However, most of his victims were not discovered or identified until the 2000s. Much speculation has been shared regarding the number of people involved in such a crime and how the three young boys were so easily subdued, if it was just a lone passer through. Being that West Memphis was a large hub for truckers and travelers, it created a much larger pool for suspects that was pretty much ignored by law enforcement at the time. The three attended Boy Scouts together, a common interest they shared that led a lot of their free play into the more natural and wooded areas. Michael Moore was especially enthusiastic about Scouts and was known to wear his uniform for fun in his spare time, including on this day that the boys went missing. This has been noted in most of the mainstream media presentations of this topic, but not really explored beyond that. Is it possible that Daniel had come across the boys, had struck up the conversation in relation to the Boy Scout uniform, and then proceeded to offer to show them some knots that Boy Scouts wouldn't have taught them? Being a former naval officer after all, this would definitely be something they had in common. The teaching of and use of knots in both the Scouts program and for sailors is a pretty major factor. It would probably also have been pretty easy to egg three young boys into being tied up with a challenge to get out of it with a promise to be shown how to tie those same knots afterwards. Now this is just speculation, but it would explain why it seemed that none of the boys put up much of a fight, even if there were only one perpetrator. Conahan was very smart, and sometimes that works to their disadvantage, because when people are very smart, they think that, you know, I can get over on this guy and I'm gonna walk out of here and they're gonna look somewhere else. They, they get maybe overly confident. And that was working for us in this case. We have to talk about it yet. I suspect you're involved. I, I suspect that right now. Maybe you're gonna smell that. Maybe I'm not involved, all right? I've had uh, fantasy, you know, I have fantasies about the, the bondage and stuff, but I'm not engaged in that. He denied uh, being involved in any you know, want any bondage or offering people, you know, money. And, and all the people in your lifestyle we talk, talk to, you're the only one that has talked about having fantasies and discussing those fantasies about what types of money we'll take pictures. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people all over that do that. There's people that make a living selling magazines doing that. There's people that, you know, I mean, I it's a fantasy. It's, then we all have fantasies. We all have fantasies. We have not lived out. He didn't really have an alibi. His alibi was, I just didn't do it. Eventually, I can tell he's getting tired. He's getting to the point where he may be feeling a little bit threatened. So I decided that it was time to, to shut the interview down because I wanted another chance uh, to interview him because I knew at some point we're going to be arresting him. You know that? Yeah. So I wanted to leave on a good note, and that's the way we ended it. Thank you for your time. Later on, with his more full-grown victims, he would coerce them into bondage photos, including ropes in a wooded area. Knowing a teen boy or grown man would get wise to what was happening sooner and had the potential to fight back, he ensured to position them in such a way that they were unable to stand and or fight. All of his victims were young travelers, either hitchhikers or cruising for men who were looking for company, as he had been in bars previously. 
The media dubbed the person committing the crimes the hog trail killer. All of the victims were strangled and mutilated. We started looking at what we had. They were all very similar. The story left a community on edge. Detective Ricky Hobbs of the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office was assigned to investigate the case. Well, the community was concerned, uh, right, rightfully. They were concerned. To have multiple bodies showing up, regardless of whether one person's doing it or more than one person's doing it, I'm not sure which one's more frightening, but certainly it was, it was a pretty nerve-wracking time for people who lived here. Russell Kershey was working for the state attorney's office at the time. He recalls how one of the killer's intended victims helped eventually crack the case. They went into the woods or some isolated location to have to have Mr. Burden um, did not realize what was going on until he was tied up. He was somehow able to get away from Mr. Conahan and steal his car. In a cruel twist, Burden was arrested for that theft. And apparently told his public defender what had happened and nobody believed him. And who would believe such a preposterous story? You know, I stole the car because the man was trying to, you know, had tied me up and was going to kill me. Who believes that? But detectives took notice of the story and placed the owner of the car, Daniel Conahan Jr., under surveillance. After 51 days, Daniel Conahan Jr. was arrested and charged with the murder of Richard Montgomery. He was looking for street people, people that were out on the street that really didn't have a home or didn't have family or anybody to, to keep after him. The state's strongest evidence was fibers found on Montgomery's body that matched fiber samples pulled from Conahan's car. Conahan was convicted of that single murder in 1999 and sentenced to die. Now, 11 years later, Conahan is returning to Charlotte County. In this 76-page appeal to the 20th Judicial Circuit Court, he alleges that his defense attorneys were inept and that his due process rights were violated. I have no question in my mind that they, that they did it right. Despite what prosecutors and detectives believe, Conahan will return to Charlotte County to have another day in court. West Memphis was sort of out of the way, going between Chicago and Florida, but perhaps he had wanted to go far enough away out of his comfort zone for his first time. Then after getting away with it, he went back to his old stomping grounds and waged war on the very thing he hated in himself, that others were living quite freely and happily. Perhaps we'll never know. But Damien Eccles, who is considered the ringleader of the Memphis Three, still maintains their innocence. And as of 2023, they are seeking justice for the ways in which their case was mishandled and manipulated to suit a narrative, and the 18 years they spent behind bars. Nearly 20 years on death row for a crime he says he didn't commit. The murder of three young boys in West Memphis back in 1993. While this is a day of celebration for him, he says no matter what happens, justice will never be fully served. This was something for a long time that when I looked at this day, I thought that's the day when I will finally be free of, you know, the, the state system, the, the prison apparatus. But now there's so much new stuff going on in the case that even though the 10, year, 10 years is over, it's been a decade, I'm still not free. Even though the handcuffs aren't locked around his wrist, for Damien Eccles, some days still feel like he's right back in that cage. I can still close my eyes and I can still see every detail of the cell I was in, from the cracks in the concrete floor to the pattern of the concrete on the walls, you know, the, the chipped paint. I can still see it like I'm all like I'm still there even after 10 years. On August 19, 2011, Eccles walked off of death row after taking a plea deal that allowed him to maintain his innocence despite a guilty plea. I always think of it as like my second birthday. You know, it was a day of being reborn back into the world. Uh, you know, a day that I did not know if it was ever going to come or not. For the past two years, Eccles and his attorneys have been requesting DNA evidence that wasn't around years ago. But a month ago, his attorneys were told some of that crucial evidence is, quote, likely lost or destroyed. The evidence that could prove his innocence. We had a chance to conclusively show once and for all who committed these murders. It's a fight that he's not giving up on and a fight that has gained national attention. I have people who were DMing me saying, I am uh, i don't live in America, what can I do? For Jillian Pensavale, this is as universal as it is personal. She met Eccles at his first art show after his release. It became like this instant friendship and this instant connection. A friendship that Pensavale says has turned into family. Recently using her podcast, True Crime Obsessed, and her own social media to shed light on the current situation of the case and push for change. Nicely, just call the West Memphis Police Department, call the, the governor's office, call Keith Cressman, the prosecuting attorney, and ask 
questions. Like we are entitled to know this information. That current support and the hundreds of others who held signs back in the early days of the case, Eccles believes is the reason he's still here today. I know to the core of my soul that the only reason the state did not murder me and sweep this case under the rug was because people all over the world were paying attention to it. While Eccles is looking toward the future, nothing will change the tragedy of the past. Nothing that happens in this situation is going to bring those three children back. Nothing that happens in this situation is going to give me or the other two men convicted 20 years of our lives back. Eccle says that he and his lawyers are still waiting on the court to set a date for a hearing about that missing evidence. He says they'll take it all the way to the state Supreme Court if they have to. Winona has not spoken on the subject since or on any of the current matters regarding the West Memphis Three. And it seems the media has tried to distance her from her early involvement in their defense as much as they can. Likely because she is at the peak of her comeback and Stranger Things is quite the popular franchise which they'd want to protect at all costs. When you're looking at something like this and you're assessing a situation like this, which is so um, unjust, unfair, you know, I mean, on all sides, um, you make a decision, you know, and it's very simple. You know, everybody, anybody and everybody who saw those initial documentaries, you make a choice, am I going <clears> to <throat> watch the thing and go, oh wow, that's really horrible, and, you know, you go out and get a milkshake, or am I going to go, you know what, that's just, you know, it's, I, I can't, I'm, not, I'm unable to swallow that. We were getting ready to do an interview a while ago, and the first thing Johnny says is, this is over, we've got to find it. <laughs> It's one of those things, he didn't just support us while we were in prison, he's been with us every single step of the way since we got down, he's become like a brother. And that's one of the things we always do, you know, just as part of that bond is whenever you get tattoos like that, it's something that both of you carry with you for the rest of your life, and it's really meaningful. So at that point, we thought we should put more funding into further DNA testing. And we're getting packages and shipments of all sorts of DNA samples that we're then forwarding on to our DNA expert. Out there was a process that was going on that either would be the impetus for exoneration or would be the state's last chance to demonstrate in this highly controversial case that he was good for it. And Damien's reaction to that was that he was absolutely adamant about the DNA test. I suppose it's not the best optics for her, especially now. I do think it's interesting though, that Winona's character on Stranger Things is named Joyce Byers, and the entire plotline surrounds the initial disappearance of her son, Will Byers. These episodes that you're having, I think Dr. Owens is wrong, I think they're real. But, but I can't help you if I don't know what's going on. So you have to talk to me, please. No more secrets. It had been believed that Christopher Byers had been the target due to the extreme nature of the mutilation and damage inflicted to him specifically. It seemed that the other two boys were more so subdued and then discarded. The character of Will Byers also shares similarities in appearance. And in episode eight of season two, there is a scene where the character is tied up with rope. Whether Winona had any say in the name choice or has any intentional reference or tribute to that is unclear, but still worth mentioning. It's almost more like a, a feeling. Like the one you had that night at the, the arcade. Yes. While fans are patiently awaiting the fifth installment of Stranger Things, they do have a pretty wide selection of spin-off material, including comic books, novellas, and the Beyond Stranger Things series. Welcome to the table as we begin our ongoing discussion. Thank you for laughing as I started. Welcome to our table. As we start this journey, I'm joined by Millie Bobby Brown, who plays Eleven, Finn Wolfhard, who is our Mike. Uh, we have executive producer and director of a number of episodes, uh, Sean Levy, and of course the show's creator, the Duffer Brothers, Matt and Ross. Welcome. 
where the cast and directors discuss the series and reveal behind the scenes secrets. As of currently, Winona is still with longtime partner, fashion designer Scott McKinley Hahn, with the pair being cited at various events, including the premiere of Stranger Things 4 in New York on May 14th of 2022. The two maintain that they still have no plans for marriage, but that their relationship is happy and healthy. In March of 2023, Winona sat down for Interview Magazine and shared some more intimate details about her upbringing and the inner workings of the commune she was raised. She asserts that her parents were intellectual hippies, not on the taking drugs in a field and listening to the Grateful Dead side. They shared 300 acres of land with other families, all of which had their own homestead. Where was I born? I was born in a farmhouse in Winona, Minnesota. That's true. And I was what they called a shoelace baby. I was a little early and back in 71, what you did is you boiled a shoelace to tie off the umbilical cord. So that's some trivia. Not a lot of people know that. She believes Western religions are like death cults, that religion can be a beautiful thing, but that it's all fiction after all. She adds that she believes in legalizing drugs, that it takes away the incentive of money and the war on drugs, and gives more room for people to get help. She then goes on to admit that she was making fun of herself for Beetlejuice in a way, and that she wore her own clothes for the part. As a teen, her favorite song was 16 Blue by The Replacements. I think that covers everything. Big shiny thanks to those of you that made it to the end. If you like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up. And if you want to be notified when I upload new videos, make sure to subscribe and click that little bell. And I will catch you on the flip side.